morning? Oh, yeah. It doesn't sound like it. <laughs> I, I tell you, you know, an extra hour of sleep sometimes is a benefit, and uh, sometimes it's a blessing, sometimes it's a curse. I, I, the, the weather didn't help this morning. And I don't know, anybody else have a hard time getting up? No. no? Some, of you, some, of y'all, some of you have never been so early in your life, right? Um, you know, if you haven't been around here, uh, over the last several weeks, we've been asking and answering some how questions, some what questions, and some why questions. And we've been getting God's take on some, some challenging questions. Um, I, this is a series that I, I've told you from the very beginning, which, by the way, we're coming to a quick end really soon, that I've really struggled with. And week after week, I've wrestled with it. Yet week after week, God has affirmed that this is what needed to be said. Because the reality is that even though some things are being said here, you're hearing something different. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit speaks to us as the Holy Spirit is indwelling. And as we hear the word that is a living, breathing thing, we all receive it differently. And God has been meeting us week after week, right where we are. And I'm just, I'm just so glad that he's better than I am. <laughs> I'm just so glad that uh, he will always win. Last week, we answered a lot of questions that stir up drama, that that stir up arguments, uh, that stir up disagreements, division, and and it's a lot of fun. We talked about areas of conscience. We talked about areas that the Bible doesn't necessarily speak out against, but it also doesn't affirm. And so there's these areas where you you have the freedom to make decisions on certain things. And so we, we talked about these things. We talked about these areas biblically and how every one of us were on one side of the fence in most cases. But we used a guiding principle, a guiding command last week, the, the greatest command that God gave us, that, that Christ gave us. It's found in Matthew 22. You, remember, you may remember this passage. It says that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, basically with everything that we are. And then he goes on and he says, and, and secondly, and just as important, you need to love your neighbor as yourself. And so when you find yourself in these moments where you don't necessarily agree with somebody, you're still called to love them. You're, you're still called to love them you know, as yourself. You're, you're still called uh, to be nice to them and be kind to them. And, and we are coming back to this passage. All we did was read that as an opening as we tackled some of the things. Last week, this was the passage, hey, don't get mad at each other. Today, we're going to actually go there, and we're going to talk about this. We're coming back to this. We're going to lean in a little bit more, and we're going to um, tackle a very appropriate question, a very appropriate how question. Here's the question we're going to tackle. How How do we love people with whom we disagree with? How how do we love people with whom we disagree with? We are surrounded by people we don't agree with. I mean, you can literally, we can take just any five of you and put you in a room and guarantee three of you might be on the same page and two of you are very different or vice versa. You know, three of you on different pages, two of you on the same. So we all know this. We work with people like this. We have friends on Facebook like this. We have people in the church like this. Some of us live with people like this that we disagree with all the time. And so this is what we're going to talk about today. Before we do, let let, let me pray for us and we're going to get started. Lord, we thank you today for bringing us here. We, We thank you today to know that you brought us here. We thank you today to know that you're a loving, graceful, awesome God. Uh, who uh, sends us through seasons of life for reasons. And Lord, you bring people in our lives and out of our lives for reasons. Lord, you put us in jobs and homes and relationships and surrounded by people for a reason. And just like these reasons we were brought here today, Lord, we have a a word that we're going to receive from you. It's a word that not one of us walked through these doors by accident, but because you brought us here. And so because of this, we don't want to miss it. Don't let us be distracted. Don't let our minds wander. Don't let the enemy win. No, we don't want that. We want to hear directly from you. So, Lord, have your way with all of us and have your way from start to finish throughout this entire worship service. Lord, we pray these things in your holy, your precious, and your mighty name. And all God's people say, amen. Amen. Uh, let, me, let me talk to the parents for a second in the, in the room. Uh, parents, grandparents, <laughs> do you remember the, um, do you remember your, the birth of your kid or kids? Uh, do, you, do you remember that? Uh, you know, I, 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 I often... I, I, I had three, right? Uh, I, I say that, and if Megan was here, you're like, you didn't have three. 
you know. Uh, but we, we've had three. And I don't know about you, but after three, the reality of having the child still hasn't set in. Meaning, not, not like the fact of the um, parent, the, the, the whole idea of even if I'm in the delivery room right now, I still have like this false concept of what that looks like. I don't know about you, but when I went um, for all three births of the children, uh, it, it was like this thing. It was like I, I, had, I had a bag packed. I had a magazine uh, picked out. I had playlists. I had a portable Bluetooth speaker. And in my mind, uh, this is how things were going to go down. We would go in the, the delivery room. I'm going to put on the playlist with, you know, little Sarah McLaughlin, Coldplay, you know, whatever, whatever Megan's feeling that day. It's going to be beautiful. I'm going to sit in the corner, read up on Golf Magazine or Watch Magazine. And as I'm sitting over there, Megan's going to be comfortable and looking beautiful on the bed. And there's going to be a, a foreign nanny sitting there in a foreign accent saying, you're going to be fine. It's going to be beautiful. No pain, no sorrow. The baby's gonna come out looking like a Gerber child. And we're gonna kiss it, love it, and life will be great. None of those things happened. I mean, she was screaming. It looked like a scene from The Exorcist. And it was like Emily Rose meets Linda Blair. I mean, and that child, I mean, that child comes out with a square, triangle, round head all at the same time. With a color that I didn't even know existed. And it's covered in goo in a yucky substance that I, I'm not even sure what that is. The nurses and the doctors are wearing hazmat suits. <laughs> and this is the perfect scene. It's nasty, it's messy, and it makes no sense. But I gotta tell you something, in that moment, there's no more beautiful thing on this planet than seeing that child. With the goofy shaped head, the odd coloration, the weird stuff, all of you just, the head that you just not just, it doesn't matter. You immediately see value. And I got to tell you something, there's nothing that can change that. My kids have gotten me sick. My kids have cost me an ungodly amount of money. So some of you adult parents can probably say amen to that too. You're still costing them. My, my kids have literally cost me sleep. I haven't slept in seven years. I used to look like George Michael, now I look like this. I don't know what happened. <laughs> the sacrifice and the cost, unbelievable. But can I tell you something? I love them beyond words, and there's nothing that will ever change that. Why do I bring this up? Because this is how our Heavenly Father feels about you. We're messy. We're jacked up. We are covered in goop and nastiness. And guys, some of us are goofy looking. You know who you are. <laughs> and we have pasts and we have mistakes. And man, we're messy. We're really messy. Regardless of it, he loves us. And this is why we start right here, because I want you to understand something. Before we go any further, I want you to hear me say this. It's on the screen behind me. God loves messy people. And I want you to hear me say this. God loves messy people like you. And he loves messy people like me. He loves messy people that you like. And he loves messy people that you don't like. He loves people that votes like you. He loves people that don't vote like you. Some of you just got mad. Get over it. He loves people who feel the way you do, and he loves people that don't feel the way you do. God loves everybody, and we are called to do the same, and this is a hard pill to swallow. And so, here's our question again. How do we love people with whom we disagree with? People with different morals? People with different beliefs? People with different theology? People with different ethics? Religions? Sexual orientation, people who have hurt us, people who have wronged us, people who we completely and utterly don't like, that are messy, difficult. People that all we see is them messing up. All we see is them being everything that we wish they weren't, but yet God still loves them. How do we deal with these people? Well, 
I'm going to go to a familiar passage in Scripture, and I want you to join me in, in, in John 8. It'll be on the screen behind me. It's in your Bibles in John 8. It's a familiar passage. I hope it's familiar to you. Uh, it's a familiar passage, and um, I, I will paint the picture through the Scriptures. Let's begin reading in verse 2. Are you with me? Yes. Come on. Are you with me? Yes. Ah, yeah, I got you. Here we go. Early the next morning. He was back again in the temple. This is Jesus. And a crowd soon gathered, and he sat down, and he told them. And he was speaking, and the teachers of the religious law, the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, literally in the act of adultery. And they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses says that we are to stone her. What do you say we should do? They were trapping him, or trying to at least and to saying something that they could use <laughs> against him. Now, here's the picture, guys. Jesus is in the temple courts teaching. The temple courts, best way to uh, describe this would be like being in the fellowship hall. Like it's an informal setting down where Jesus is just teaching. He's teaching in the temple courts, and they, they bring this lady in front of them, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the teachers. Come, these are the religious elites. This was the uppers of the church. They come to try to trick Jesus, like the Bible says, they're trying to get him to say something they know can condemn him. Now, these guys on paper were perfect. They looked good on paper, meaning they looked apart, the they walked apart, the they had the status. You would see them and be like, oh, look at them, because they look good. They dress good. They look like a good old church going pew set and Christian. And that's what they looked like, and they knew the word. They knew the word better than anybody. They memorized the Old Testament. They knew all the commandments. They knew it all. And so these guys, they didn't like Jesus. Let me tell you why. It's a very simple, very, very simple reason. They didn't like Jesus because Jesus preached two things. Compassion. <laughs> he preached compassion and conviction. These guys were the opposite. They preached on the conviction of legalism and fear. So they, they preyed on people's ability to follow the rules. It was like, you better do these things or you're going to hell. And Jesus was like, no, 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 no. We, we, guys, I'm going to teach you compassion. I'm going to teach you conviction. Yes, you need to turn away, but I'm going to love you the whole way through. And what was happening was their following was decreasing and his following was increasing. Jealousy had crept in. Now, how did they catch her? How did they catch her? Were they creepers? I mean, what was going on? Well, actually, they had set this whole thing up. And they were trying to make this thing happen. And when they referenced that she should be stoned, this was an Old Testament practice in Deuteronomy 22. Uh, read it sometime. That would say that if a woman was caught into adultery, she was to be put to death. Now, what is horrible about this scene? I want you to get this, guys, because this is relevant to what we're talking about. What stands out to me, what I find very sad, is that these religious elitists, these so-called believers, they did not care about this woman's well-being. They didn't care about her healing. They didn't care about her redemption. They didn't care about what she had been through. She was being used. Just like she had been used in this affair, in this moment, in this messed up situation, she was being used once again. And what Jesus does is kind of odd. He stoops down, look at verse 6, and he writes in the dust with his finger. It's kind of odd, isn't it? When you're arguing with somebody and you were just like, <laughs> I mean, it might end the argument fast. They might think you've lost it. I, I, I think you've lost it. In the middle of the argument, Jesus stoops down and begins to write in the dirt. I mean, never. You, you don't do that. And Jesus knew what he was doing. There was a purpose as he was writing in the dust. Some people think that he was writing passages of scriptures in the dirt. Some people believe that he was writing various sins in the dirt. Uh, but I believe that he was clearly writing their names. Now, Jeremiah 17, verse 13 says this, The Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who turn away from you will be disgraced. They will be burned in the dust of the earth. Now, in the original text, the original language that was used here, it actually doesn't say it this way. It says, they will be written in the dust. And so this is what Jesus, what Jesus actually said and what, what he was referencing here and doing here. And based on what God documented over in Jeremiah was that their names will be written in the 
and us. And I believe Jesus was writing their names. He was making a point. You guys think that this woman is so far from God. You think this woman is, is such a train wreck because of the affair that she has been in. But guys, you are just as bad. You know the scriptures word for word, but you don't know love. You know what the Bible says, but you don't live what the Bible says. And you know the same thing is for you and me. We can know the Bible through and through. But if we don't live out the Bible, if, if you don't show love and compassion, it does you no good. So what am I saying? You can know the word. You can memorize the scriptures. You can put a Jesus sticker on your car. You can have a really nice Bible. You can attend church every single Sunday. You can go to Sunday school. You can go to Bible study. You can post your motivational scriptures on Facebook. You can look the part, act the part, but if you don't apply it, if you're not living out the gospel, you're actually hurting things more than you are helping. They didn't get it, and sometimes we don't get it. Look at verses 7 and 8. They kept demanding for an answer, and so he stood up again and he said, All right, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again, and he continued to ride in the dust. This was brilliant. Guys, this was brilliant because Jesus was awesome and he knew what he was doing. He knew that they weren't going to throw a stone. He knew it. He knew they weren't going to throw a stone. Because they believed, just like we believe, that God was the only sinless being in existence. So if someone picked up a stone and threw that stone, what they would be doing is they would be claiming to be on the same level of God. They'd be lying. And lying was a big deal. Lying was one of the uh, 613 commands that they knew very well in the Old Testament. Lying was such a big deal that it even made it in the Big Ten, right? The Ten Commandments. And this would have been blasphemy. This would have been blasphemy if they, if they put themselves on the same level as God. And what's interesting is blasphemy would have equaled the same penalty as the lady who was called adultery. Blasphemy, you would... You would have the death penalty. The same stone that they threw would be thrown right back at them. Let's get to the best part. You still with me? Yes. Verses 9 through 11, when the accusers heard this, <laughs> look at this, they begin to slip away one by one. Did you, I want to get the imagery here. It's like they hear this and they're like, oh, I got, I got a call. I got to take this. They didn't have cell phones. They're just going away one by one. Look at the bathroom. I'm out of here. You know, they're one by one. They begin to slip away, beginning with the oldest until Jesus left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Just him and her standing there. And Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one condemn you? No, not one. Not one, she said. Now look at, look at verse 11. This is so good. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. People we don't like, people we don't agree with, people who we want to judge and condemn and crucify. He says, dude, where are your accusers? Here's something we need to realize. Jesus was always, when you read the gospel, this is, here's our big takeaway. When you read the gospel, there are two things we always saw with Jesus, grace and truth. They were always together. He was always about grace and he was always about truth. Uh, in John's gospel, chapter 1, verses 14 and 17, for the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. This is him, right? Verse 17, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth, and that came through Jesus Christ. Jesus was full of both. And in this room, I guarantee you, just like last week, we could split down the middle and some of us would be on different teams. Some of us would have, like last week, we were all about tattoos, some of us were against it. All of us were about alcohol, some of us were against it. We could keep going down that list. Some of us were all about trick-or-treating, some of us said, you're going to hell. You know, it's like, you can get on, you know the grace and truth, I guarantee you we could literally go down and I, because I, I know, I know some of you, and we talk, and, and you know who you are, and you're like, well, I'm all about the truth. 
And you know, this is this is it. And it's almost all like a grace, grace. <laughs> it's all about Jesus' love. It's all about that goodness. But here's the thing: we have to be about both. And Jesus came full of both. Now, I get a question all the time. I think my mic might have died. Yep. We'll deal with that later. Go on, we can hear you. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that off. <clears throat> People ask me all the time why I've I've wore a rubber band on my wrist for probably, what, about 14 years. I wear rubber bands, and the reason why I wear rubber bands is it's to remind me of Jesus' truth and grace. And I want, I want to explain this to you. You see, there's, a, there's this rubber band, and on one side, if you're just holding it by one side, there's no power to it. it. It's just flimsy. It's weak. It really doesn't serve much purpose other than to mess with it. Same thing on the other side. Weak and flimsy. It's, but the power comes in the tension. The power comes when you begin to pull it apart, when you begin to twist it and separate it. Over and over again, that the, the power is in the tension. And so this rubber band can serve as a reminder. On one side, you have grace. And on one side, you have truth. And the tension in between that rubber band is love. That's where the love exists. It's this idea of you have to be both. You have to be full of truth. And you have to be full of grace. You have to be full of truth. And you have to be full of of grace and the, the tension in between is the love. It's this idea of I'm gonna love you regardless of what you are and what you do, but I'm going to show you grace and I'm gonna show you truth all the time. But it's gonna be held together in love. Now there are rubber bands in the back. I hope you will take them. Amazon sent me the wrong ones, they're big. <laughs> so you wear it as a necklace. <laughs> My choke you know, I, you can double it up and, uh, and wear it as, as such, but the power lies in the tension. And can I tell you something? The tension is where it's uncomfortable, guys. Mm -hmm. See, it's a, it, that, that's the that's where it gets uncomfortable. It's in the this is the tension. This is where it gets uncomfortable is having to love somebody in the middle of grace, in the middle of truth. And what we do is we run to one side or the other, depending on who we're talking to. So because I don't agree with you, I'm going to run over here to the truth. Because my truth is right. Mm -hmm. Or because I maybe feel a certain way, I'm going to go over to the grace. And I'm going to leave the truth over there. And we have to be balanced with both. And, and that, is, that is where that tension is. And many of us don't like that tension. And so we stop loving people. And I think sometimes, here, here's what I want you to hear me say. I, I find myself having to defend myself sometimes. With people that I love. They can't believe that, that I'm okay with this person. With what they do. Or with what they are. I want you to hear me say something. Just because you don't agree with somebody. This is going to be therapeutic for somebody. Doesn't mean you don't have to love them. Just because you don't agree with somebody's lifestyle. Their decisions. Their choices. Who they are. What they are. What they believe. What they're doing. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It doesn't mean you're not called to love them. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what you're called to do. Mm -hmm. Is to love them and to show them grace and to show them truth. Don't be on one side or the other. Be both. Be both. I know it gets uncomfortable sometimes. Mm -hmm. It does. But God is fine with uncomfortable. Because that's where God does some of his best work. It's outside of our comfort zones. It's outside of our, it's outside of our, our ability to avoid confrontation and avoid those moments. We struggle with this truth. And can I tell you why we do? Because of personal emotions. That's what happens. Our personal emotions step in and we run and we avoid or overreact and go to one side or the other. And we end up not being a loving person. And so am I a person of love and grace? Am I a person who, will, who embraces people who are different than me, who are messier than me, who don't look like me? 
The church is supposed to be a beautiful mosaic of messy people. Mm -hmm. The day you think, if you think that you've got it all figured out mm -hmm. and that you're perfect, I want you to hear me. This ain't the place for you. Because this is a place <coughs> of imperfect, messed up people that love the fact that we have a God who makes us right where we are and who loves us the way we are. And who loves us enough to never leave us there. Who will grow us to, to change and to be different. We have a lot of different walks in this place. We have a lot of different beliefs, opinions, thought processes. We have people that vote on all kinds of different sides of the spectrum. We have people that believe this way and that way and the other way. But the reality is, is that God makes us whole in Him. And so this sounds exhausting, doesn't it? Showing grace and love. So what does this look like? I'm going to give you three simple ways to show this and to maybe live with this tension. How do we live with the tension and what does it look like? Here it is. Here's the first thing I would tell you. <sighs> Let this sink in, guys. Be known for what you are for rather than what you're against. One of the greatest things you can do with dealing with people whom you disagree with is be Known for what you're for, not what you're against. Too many of us are all about what we aren't for. That's what we lead with. Let me tell you what I hate. I mean, we're, we were like negative, right? Let me tell you the problem with this nation. <laughs> Let me tell you whose fault it is. Let me be an oh so joyous person. Listen, lead with what you are for. Lead with the fact that you have a God who is loving, graceful, and who's in control of all of this. Imagine that. Instead of getting all worked up about all the things that you're unsure of, that you honestly say, you know what? I am sure of a God who, if he wants something different in Washington, he'll change it. If he wants something different in my life, he'll change it. If he wants to fix this thing, that thing, the other thing, he'll change it. I know I've got a loving, graceful God who tells me the truth from Genesis to Revelation, and I've got great news. And I'm going to live through this great news. And I am a sinner who is saved by grace and faith in Him. And He loves you and so do I. Imagine leading this way. When the woman was caught in the affair, when the Pharisees confronted her, were the Pharisees right? Did she sin? Yes. She was wrong. She was having an affair. She was wrong in what she was doing. But was Jesus for her? Yes, Jesus was absolutely for her. Was he for her redemption? Was he for her reconciliation? Was he for giving her another chance? Yes, I want you to see this. He wasn't against her. He was for her. He loved her. And this is what we have to understand. This is what you and I need to embrace. Is that yes, people can be wrong. And people can be train wrecks. But God is for them. His son died for them just like he died for you and just like he died for me. You can have correct doctrine. That's the truth, guys. Mm -hmm. You can have correct doctrine, you, meaning you can be right. Let's go ahead and make it plain terms. You can be right, but you can be an absolute heretic on the way you treat people. Mm -hmm. You can be an absolute, just oh so joyful person in the way that you love others. So how do you fix it? Here's number two. Don't allow fear and emotion to determine the value of another person. Some of you are going to be heavy on the fear. Some of you are going to be heavy on the emotion. Meaning that you are, you're afraid because you don't understand. You don't understand this person. You don't understand their decisions. You don't understand their choices. You don't understand why they feel the way they feel. You don't understand why they do the way they, they, they do and why they function the way they function. And some of it is the fear of the unknown. And then others of us is the, the emotional thing. And we, we just feel heavily about how we feel. And therefore, because we feel this way about all people that are this way, we're going to let that determine the value of those people. Because all of those people are the same. That's, that's how we act. That's how we believe. And I think if we're being honest, through those fear and through those emotions, it makes it really hard to bridge that gap. It make, this is the bridge, that love gap, because we feel so strongly over here with the emotions or so strongly over here with the fear that we wouldn't dare walk across that bridge and just love somebody. That we wouldn't just show them the grace of God. 
The bridge isn't saying all to the truth. I want you to hear me say this. When you love people, you are not altering the truth. You're actually fulfilling the truth. Remember, that's what he said. This is the greatest commandment I give to you. And, and he said, secondly, and equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The bridge is not saying that you embrace or alter the truths that you have, that you, that you turn your back on the truths or convictions. Not at all. The bridge is saying everyone is messy and has value. Everyone needs grace. Everyone needs truth. Everyone needs love. So it's not a matter of changing your view of theology, but rather changing your view of that person. I want you to hear me say that. It's not changing your view on theology. It's not changing what you believe in God's word. It's changing the way you view that person. Hold strong to your beliefs. I'm, hear me say that. Hold strong to the truth. Hold strong to the truth that you know, but love people no matter what, because everybody has value. Third and finally, embrace the difference between acceptance and agreement. There's a big difference, guys. Embrace the difference between acceptance and agreement. Acceptance is commanded. Agreement, approval, and affirmation is not. I'm going to say that again, just in case you missed it. Acceptance is commanded. Agreement, approval, and affirmation is not. Acceptance is loving people. I want you to hear me say this. Acceptance is loving people for who they are. Where they are, no matter what. Didn't think you would like that. Loving people for who they are, where they are, no matter what. That's what we're called to do. You think you came to Jesus when you had it all together? No, you didn't. You know you did it. Most of us found Jesus because we were a train wreck and he saved us. We were in a point of desperation and you're like, God, you got to fix this. You gotta fix my marriage, you gotta fix my depression, you gotta fix my anxiety, you gotta fix this. I have messed up. I've made a mistake and I'm calling upon your name. I need if you can fix this and if you exist, I'm yours. That's how I've heard that prayer a thousand times. And he does what he does best and he steps in. And the reality is, is that he we have value and they have value. Jesus goes off about this in Matthew 5. It's, it's 10 verses. I'm not going to read them all. It's verses uh, Matthew 5, 38 through 48. 46 kind of sums it up. If you only love those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even the tax collectors, the corrupt tax collectors, can do that much. That was the bad people of Jesus' day. Everybody hated tax collectors. They did. So then this was the hated people. And it was like even the, the crooks, even the bad guys, can 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 do that you're no different than them paul says the same thing in romans 12 9 through 18 but it sums it up in verse 18 look at verse 18 do all that you can to live at peace with everyone all that you can what that means is even though you don't agree with them even though you think they're making horrible decisions even though they are completely opposite of you and all you believe For the point of peace and to love your neighbor as yourself and to live out the love with all your soul, all your mind, and all that you are to him. You, you love them. You live at peace. We are called to love, to live out grace and truth. And when we do, guys, can I tell you the difference we make? We actually can make an influence and a difference in people's lives. All of this stuff is brought up today because we are called, every single one of us, to be Jesus' hands and feet. We are his plan A. I tell you this all the time. You are ministers. You are, you are called to be ministers of the gospel. You're full-time missionaries. Here, right here where you live, where you eat, sleep, and play, where you work, where you go, when you're at Walmart, when you're at Wawa, when you're when you are at work, this is your moment to minister truth and grace and love. And to show people Jesus, to show his unconditional love, and to minister his truth and grace, to be both, to make a difference in someone's life. Someone messy. Someone who's different than you, but someone who is just different in the mess that they're in than you. Because we're all messy. And God loves messy people. This is how we're going to do this. May we be people of love. 
May we be people of grace and truth. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, I thank you today for giving us this opportunity to be here and to be in your word. In this moment to explore these teachings of your truth. Lord, you always give us what we need when we need it. And today, you brought us here to hear these words because we needed to hear them. And Lord, there are people in our lives right now who maybe we've been avoiding. Maybe we have been treating differently than we should. Maybe we have been bashing, condemning. Actually being the opposite of what we need. To be people of love, just like you. Lord, to represent you well. May we see value in others the way you see us. Lord, we're all messy. We are all fallen short. We've all fallen short of your glory. We we're all sinners. Lord, may we just lead with being all about all the things we're for and not against. May we lead with a passion of understanding that the person that we encounter, maybe all they need is just somebody to smile. Maybe they just need somebody to shake their hand or their put our hand on their shoulder and tell them all is well. Just to be nice to them. Just to love them. Just to do the things that you would do. Lord, may we live this life full of both grace and truth. And may we continually walk the bridge of love. If we do this, Lord, we know that we will be fulfilling that which you've asked of us. To love others as ourselves and to love others as you would love them. Lord, I ask that you would let not one of us leave this place the same way we came in. But we believe your challenge, change, and encourage. Lord, we, we thank you. We praise you.